Information superhighway is finding its way to all our doors. Electric cables, gas and water pipes are being joined by a new range of electronic services. It's not just telephones that talk to each other. Televisions and computers can communicate across the world. Thousands of telephone conversations and pages of the internet, together with numerous TV channels, can be carried simultaneously by optical fibres. Only a small proportion of the population is connected up, but it won't be long before information will be as welcome as water. Click on search. Ah, Scooby-Doo page. Education, entertainment and information are all accessible. The internet is available to anyone, anywhere, at any time. But do we want everything that it can deliver? The combination of telephone, television and computer is extremely powerful. Too powerful, perhaps, to be controlled. We live in a world where science has made possible things that we previously thought were impossible. My office, please. Of course, none of this is actually possible without the benefit of TV special effects. But what we can do is transfer energy without transferring matter. Now here we have an awful lot of matter, books that have served us well for centuries but all of this information can now be packed onto a single CD. But it doesn't stop there. Just come and take a look at this. Now I can get all of that information without the transport of any matter on this screen. I can get it over the airwaves and I can get it at the speed of light, not at the speed of the postman. Travelling at the speed of light 300 million meters per second are many different kinds of waves. The visible spectrum is only a small part of the electromagnetic spectrum. All these waves have the same properties, but it's the wave length that determines how they're used. Beyond the visible wavelengths, the electromagnetic spectrum continues. Larger wavelengths cannot be seen with our eyes, but their effects can be detected. Infrared is used every day to change the television channels. Radio waves have longer wavelengths than those of infrared. They are used to carry speech, music, images and computer data from one place to another. There is a whole family of radio waves. Microwaves with wavelengths of up to a few centimetres carry the signals for satellite television. Longer wavelengths transmit BBC, ITV and Channel 4. VHF is used for emergency services communications and for local radio. Short, medium and long wave radio transmits over longer distances. At this part of the electromagnetic spectrum, the wavelengths can be over 1500 metres or a mile long. All these electromagnetic waves are used for transferring information from one place to another at the speed of light. It's impossible to actually see any of these very fast waves, but there are waves that travel much more slowly. Now, in order to understand the properties of electromagnetic waves, we need to look at waves which we're more familiar with. Water waves have the same properties as electromagnetic waves. Here we're able to look at the waves in a more controlled way. 
a small electric motor agitates the water, generating what are called plane waves. A property of waves which is easy to take for granted is reflection. Here we can see the plane waves approaching the surface and being reflected. Water waves are a bit tame, so let's come and see what I call waves. We're here at Laser Point in Cambridge and we're going to see a laser light show. Now that's what I call reflection. To produce the image on the screen behind me, the laser beam is scanned across it many thousands of times a second by bouncing it off two tiny mirrors. Now to make our light show, we need to do two things. We need to reflect the light from the mirrors, but we also need to split light into its constituent colours. And we can do this by something called refraction. With light waves, a prism slows down the different colours that make up white light by different amounts. The blue light is slowed down more than the red light, and so it's bent through a greater angle. There's another very important feature of refraction. As you increase the angle at which the light strikes the block, so the wave is refracted more. Eventually, beyond a certain angle known as the critical angle, all of the light is reflected from the surface. In other words, it acts just like a mirror. This is known as total internal reflection. Total internal reflection is the means by which an optical fibre can transmit light from one destination to another. We can launch the light from a laser into the fibre and it bounces backwards and forwards by total internal reflection until it reaches the other end. At the BT labs in East Anglia, optical fibres are researched and developed as they're the true superhighways of the revolution in communications, able to carry an astonishing amount of information at the speed of light. The fibre optic cables begin as hollow tubes of glass. Heated to thousands of degrees centigrade, the glass collapses on itself. At the critical moment, impurities are added so that the outer surface of the glass is different from the inner core, which allows total internal reflection to take place. The glass rod goes through another heating process. A pull and gravity does the rest to produce the fibres that can be as thin as a human hair. One metre of glass tube produces thousands of metres of fibre optic cable. So far we've been talking of electromagnetic waves travelling in straight lines. A less familiar property of waves is that they can bend round corners. This property is called diffraction. All waves have the same basic properties. Although we can't see electromagnetic waves, we can show that they diffract in the same way as water waves. But I'm going to hand this story on to somebody else, because I don't have a head for heights. Isolated on the Yorkshire Moors, the highest freestanding building in the United Kingdom is beaming out waves 24 hours a day, transmitting radio, television and many other forms of communication. It takes as long for the lift to travel over 300 metres to the top as it takes light waves to reach Earth from the sun, about eight minutes. Well, here we are at the top. It's a little breezy up here. I think the best thing is for us to go down the level and I'll explain what we can see. The aerial at the top of the tower is very much the same as the lamp at the top of the lighthouse. The lamp at the top of the lighthouse illuminates the surrounding countryside. Here we're illuminating the surrounding countryside not with light, 
but a different form of electromagnetic waves, this time radio waves. We've got a fantastic view up here, we can see for miles, but the ground isn't flat, and people live behind some of the hills that we see around us. How do they receive their signal? Well, the answer is diffraction, and that's best illustrated if I show you a shadow of my hand. If you look at the shadow of my hand here, it's fairly distinct. As I move my hand away, that shadow becomes less and less distinct, it becomes fuzzy around the edges. This fuzziness is caused by diffraction. And in the case of radio waves, the hills are acting like my hand. They're intercepting the radio waves. The radio waves are diffracted, just like my hand diffracted the light. In the case of radio waves, though, the wavelength of the signals is much longer, so the diffraction is far more pronounced. And as a result, people living behind hills who can't see anymore can still receive a perfectly good signal. Reception here is excellent. There's absolutely nothing between us and the Emily Moore mast. But what happens if there's something between us and the mast shielding the signal? Visible light is hardly diffracted at all by the top edge of a building because it has a very short wavelength. So there's a large area behind the building from which the top of the tower cannot be seen. If there was no diffraction, the radio waves which carry TV signals would not be received in this area either. Here in the shadow of the building, we've got a very poor signal. We're not in the line of sight of the transmitter, and the picture's unwatchable. As I move forward, the signal starts to improve. Even though we still haven't got a line of sight, I begin to get a good picture. Now this picture is getting to me by diffraction. The same mechanism that's used in the valleys the people are shielded by the hills also get their signal by diffraction even though they haven't got a clear line of sight of the transmitter. Because the waves carrying the TV picture have fairly long wavelengths, they are noticeably diffracted, delivering the signal well into the shadow of the building and behind the hills to almost all the region. The basic properties of electromagnetic waves, reflection, refraction and diffraction, allow information to be transmitted in the air through cables and by satellite. The combination of the whole range of electromagnetic communication and computers has created a single entity, the Internet, which moves information around the world almost instantaneously to anyone. Social habits, work practices and leisure pursuits are all changing and they're changing at an ever-increasing rate. This information technology world really started around the turn of the century with the discovery of electromagnetic waves and the invention of devices like this, the thermionic valve. That was very shortly followed by the transistor and then the integrated circuit. Only 20 years ago, the first laptop computer was produced. Just 10 years ago, mobile phones did not exist. And when we look to the future, we have to imagine all of these technologies coming together. And so we see a range of devices like this. This is an office that you wear with a screen a mouse, and a control panel. It looks far-fetched. We have one working. It is probably only five years away from being a product. Well, now that you've seen the way the science works, there are some social issues connected with communications as well. People now worry about access to electronic information because it is everywhere and it is in every form. So what are we going to do? Technology is going so fast that if we don't understand technology, we can't control technology. And technology does need control. I would probably think it's un it is uncontrollable. It's already here. It's all too late. Is it, if you like, it's out of control. How do you undo the damage? If there is or whatever damage it's done, how do you undo it? What sort of controls are we talking about here? Well, let's consider a situation where somebody sends out terrorist or racist material over the internet. 
should governments then be able to apply sanctions to the person who sent that material? These are very difficult and complicated issues, particularly when we have to collaborate on an international scale in order to be able to find a solution. The internet is not one thing. It's all these 51,000 networks all around the world. It's not controlled by any one organization. Nobody owns it, and nobody runs the internet. Everybody runs it. If you're connected to the internet, you're part of it. And it's silly to ask who runs the internet. We don't ask who runs the telephone system. Generally speaking, the internet is controlled by internet users and you know, people on the internet. Um, it's such a sprawling kind of web net all over the place. There's no kind of one central body that, you know, where it all stems from. So I think any other policing or control is very difficult to envisage. Um, and that's kind of nice, I like that. The censorship, I think, is a similar issue. I know that there are examples of where censorship works effectively at the moment, but it's something that is not easy technically to achieve. And I think that in the meantime, uh, although we may feel it is desirable in some cases, it may not be possible to achieve. Every method of communication throughout the centuries has been followed by a welter of um, legislation because there are always people to misuse and corrupt and uh, use communication systems um, wrongly or even criminally. 24 million volumes, books, are available to us across the planet. No restriction of access. And yet, when we look at the world of internet, a world of almost infinite information, people are very, very worried about access to unsavory material. There's a lot of scaremongery about pornography on the internet, but it's not actually as accessible as people might think. In fact, um, if you're looking for dirty sites, um, it's much easier to go into your local newsagent and buy a, a dirty magazine. You get better quality pictures than if you're you know, looking for it in the internet. Um, and that's not to mean that we should close down all newsagents because they sell pornography. We must be careful in this new global information society not to develop uh, a situation where we have information haves and information have-nots. At the moment, you need quite a lot of expensive technology to access the internet. But we shouldn't assume that systems like this will be the way people are going to access the global networks in future. Cable television companies are already providing network services to people delivered to their television screens. The cost of mobile phones and other technology is coming down very rapidly. There is a danger that will create what's been called an information underclass. People who do not have access to the network and to all of the services that are provided over it. And as governments and banks and businesses and shops move to the network, these people will be left out of society. But there is signs of hope. Access is getting cheaper and easier. What we've done in Cambridge is to try and find a solution to this problem by opening a number of public access points around the city where anybody can go in, sit down in front of a terminal and access the internet completely free of charge. There is no reason why anyone should be socially disadvantaged and not have access to this technology and the information world.